I'm in 2 Kings chapter 23. We've been looking at King Josiah. Last time we talked about when King Josiah found the book. And we talked about things that's going to happen when you find the book. You need to teach your kids. You need to put it in practice. You need to make some goals. You need to build. You need to read it. You need to hear it. You need to talk to the author. You need to listen to truth. And we're going to keep going with that theme. What happens when you find the book? And what, specifically, what is the book going to do for you? The book did wonders for me. You hear a lot of people give their testimony of salvation. But the next important thing after that is, when did you find the book? I know most of you are saved but have you found the book? Here's some things that the book will do for you. It says in chapter 23, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. So it's good to have all the brethren in unity under the word of God. And you need to be with other people uh, that are Bible believers. Not just by yourself. You need to be with other people. And as much as my introverted self doesn't want to be around other people, I don't find that in the Bible to just get alone by myself all the time. That's when you get in trouble. It says, And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their ears, in their ears, all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. So all of these men gathering together to hear the word of God. The people, the priests, the prophets, the popular, the poor, small and great, everybody. The Bible's for everybody. So, let me tell you what the Bible is. The Bible is a plug for the ears. He's going to read in the ears of all these people all the words of the book of the covenant. And for years for me, the Bible has been a plug for my ears. If I'm not reading it and having my eyes taken in, I've got headphones in my ears. And my ears are taking it in. It's a plug for my ears. Now, we got these earbuds now. We got all this technology. And people and uh, workplaces are allowing you to use the earbuds more and more now. I drive through McDonald's, drive through Arby's, drive through Taco Bell. And what has everybody got in their ears? Even the guy taking your order has headphones in, has earbuds in. You got a good opportunity to plug your ears with the Bible all day long. It says he read in the ears all the words of the book of the covenant. You know, for years I thought reading it is much better than listening to it or hearing somebody else read it. Then I got to thinking, is it really that much different? Maybe you don't have the opportunity to sit down and read it as much. But you can get some earphones and put it in your ears. Plug your ears and listen to the Bible for hours and hours. And if you've got a workplace that allows you to get some headphones and plug your ears, you're just staying hooked up all day long. It's not just a Sunday morning thing for you. It's not just a Sunday night thing. It's not just a Wednesday night thing. Monday morning hits, you're plugging your ears with the word of God. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. But seek ye out the book of the Lord and plug your ears and listen to it all the time. So plug, it's a plug for the ears. And verse 3, And the king stood by a pillar. That's the next thing. The word of God is a pillar of truth. 
the king, King Josiah, stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Now he, it says, walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments. Commandments are orders given with authority. He says, and his testimonies. Testimonies is evidence to support a fact. And his statutes. Statutes is laws expressed in a document. The commandments, testimonies, statutes. That's all the word of God. And Josiah is like a pillar himself. You can be a pillar for the truth. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9 it says, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, they seemed to be pillars. You can be a pillar for the truth. How do you do that? By speaking the oracles of God. The oracles of God is what God said. And Peter says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And when you're standing up for the truth and the words that come out of your mouth are from the Bible, you can be a pillar for truth. So, and the king stood by a pillar. You need to stand by the pillar of truth, the word of God. That's exactly what Josiah did when he found the book. And he made a covenant before the Lord. That's an agreement to walk after the Lord. You're either going to walk in the flesh or you're going to walk in the spirit. When you're walking after the flesh, you're not walking with the Lord. When you're walking in the Spirit, that's when you're walking with the Lord. In Galatians, same book I just had you turn to, Galatians 5, 16. You go down to verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you see, if you... You don't walk after the Lord. You don't walk after these commandments, testimonies, statutes, and you don't stand by the pillar of truth. You're going to have the, all this. At the least having envyings, revelings, idolatry. Even if you never commit murder or have drunkenness or adultery, you're gonna, you, these verses are going to hit you somewhere with the hatred, the wrath, and the strife and the heresies. But it says in Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And notice these things. It's stuff that's on the inside. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And you see a lot of that provoking one another. You see a lot of that envying one another. And you see a lot of that being desirous of vainglory. That's not walking in the spirit that's walking after the flesh that's not walking after the lord to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of the book you see it's not about the religious stuff the religious stuff dressing nice sunday best and all that stuff that stuff's good going to church is obviously good as I said, you need to gather together. But the fruit of the Spirit is those things that 
when when you're around somebody you're showing love you got joy you've got peace you got long suffering you got gentleness when you find the book that's what the, that's the stuff that the book puts in you is all this stuff it's giving you love for people that's unlovable it's giving you joy when most people would be really depressed it's giving you peace when most people would be ready to just uh, roll over and die it's giving you long suffering when people are when the average guy would be very impatient it's giving you gentleness when most people are mean and hateful it's giving you all these things when you walk after the Lord you stand by the pillar and the word is a plug for the years the word is a pillar of truth do you want truth when everything is a, in this world seems to be like a lie and a rumor and a false flag and everything else I've always got the word of God I can go to and I can open it and I can lean on it and it's true and it's pure when everything else is unpure. So he says, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. They stood to it. They had stood to itiveness. They stood by it. All the people. Verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest. And the priests of the second order. And the keepers of the door. To bring forth out of the temple of the Lord. All the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the host of heaven, and he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Now here's the next thing the word will do for you. It plugs your ears. It can be a plug for the ears. It's a pillar of truth, and it purges your pathway. He's going to take all this wicked stuff, and he's going to burn it. He's going to take it outside and burn it. You see, you are a vessel. And he's going in the temple of the Lord. He's going to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. For Baal. He doesn't want dirty vessels in there. And you are a vessel. You need to clean yourself. You need to sanctify yourself for the Lord. Don't be a dirty vessel for the Lord. Let's look at some verses about it. In 1 Thessalonians 4, and verse 4, it says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Your body is a vessel. And in 2 Timothy 2, 21, it says this, If a man therefore purge himself from these, all this wicked stuff he was talking about, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified in meat for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Then he says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You want to be a sincere Bible believer, seeking God, calling on God, standing by the pillar of truth with a pure heart. And when you do that, this book, you get this book out and you open it up and you're reading it every day, it's going to make you want a clean house. It's going to make you want to go in the temple of the Lord. The temple today is your body. And you're going to clean house. You're going to get rid of the filthy vessels made for Baal. Now, Baal is a false god who has prophets himself. You know, everything God has, the devil wants to counterfeit for it. So, you know, any false god, you could say, well, when somebody's worshiping a false god, the devil's just getting glory and worship from that. And Baal, he's got prophets. In 1 Kings 18, 19, he's got priests. He's got worshipers. In 1 Kings 10, 19, 
He's got a faithful remnant in Zephaniah 1 4. He's got altars in Judges 6 25. He's got a house in 1 Kings 16 32. He's got an image in 2 Kings 3 2. He's got child sacrifices in Jeremiah 19 5. He's got high places in Jeremiah 32 35. That's 1 Kings 18 19. 2 Kings 10, 19, Zephaniah 1, 4, Judges 6, 25, 1 Kings 16, 32, 2 Kings 3, 2, Jeremiah 19, 5, Jeremiah 32, 35. He's got a, he's got a lot going for him. And it, he's just a, a counterfeit. He's not the real thing. He's a fake. Baal's a fake God. We've got a lot of fake gods that we try to have in our life. But see, there was vessels in there made for Baal and for the grove. Now, a grove, that can be, you know, the shadowy area of trees where they would go in there and they would worship their false gods in there because the shadow thereof is good. But then they can also make an idol out of the grove, out of those trees and worship it. In Deuteronomy 16.21, Deuteronomy 16.21, it says, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. So Josiah, he's reading that book of the law, and he sees well, we need to get rid of the groves. We need to get rid of these images. We need to get rid of Baal. In 1 Kings 15, 13, it says, And also, Micaiah, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kedron. You see, Asa was a lot like Josiah trying to get rid of these idols and burning them to get rid of them for good. It says, Josiah goes in there to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. Not only do they worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, but they worship the angels and spirits, fallen angels, that's also the host of heaven. It's not just the sun, moon, and stars like in Deuteronomy 419. It says, And lift thou, unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. When they look up, when you look up, all those stars shouldn't make you be impressed with the stars. You should be impressed with the one that made the stars for the most part and worship him. But you see, the host of heaven is the sun, moon, and the stars. But in 1 Kings 15, 13, it's also the heavenly host, the, the, like the angels and the creatures God made. Or, sorry, 1 Kings 22, 19. Is the verse I'm, I'm looking for. First Kings 22, 19 says, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And you know, the angels are called stars in Revelation 1, 20. So these people were worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, but also worshiping the angelic coast. So he in first or in second Kings twenty three four, he's going in and he's cleaning house. He's taken out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven, and he burns them. He burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests. See, 
it purges the pathway and it puts down the posers. When you open this Bible and you get so acquainted with it and you read it every day and you see the pure words every day, when the posers show up, you're going to spot them like that. You're going to know this guy is a poser. He's not a Bible believer. He doesn't care about the Word of God. He cares about his money. He cares about his reputation. He cares about all these other ulterior motives. But you stand by the pillar of truth. You see that the motive is truth. The motive is God wrote a book and he wants you to be close to him and he wants you to be saved. And all this other material junk, our religious junk, is just that. It's junk. And Josiah, he became a Bible believer. And he put down the idolatrous priests. I remember back right before I got saved, I had tuned into different TV preachers and stuff. And I thought, wow, these guys are just such great Christians. I would love to be in their shoes. I remember thinking that as a lost person. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to be T.D. Jakes or Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland? And when I lay my head down in bed at night, I could have this great conscience and I could know I'm going to heaven. But now after I got saved and I got into the Bible, I see these people have no conscience at all. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. It has to be. There's no other way that they could uh, use the Word of God and use the name of Jesus Christ to take people's money to make them rich. And they're not Bible believers. These are posers. Josiah came in there and he put down the idolatrous priests. Now, I also believe when you're in the book, and somebody else is in the book, and that person is doing a great thing with the Word of God, you will recognize that as well, and you're not going to constantly attack that person. You know, I appreciate anybody doing something for God out of a sincere heart. Even if I don't necessarily agree with them in many ways, I see, I can tell that they're sincere, and they love God, and they love the Bible, and they're trying to do something. And I don't, I just, uh, uh, when I got the Bible and I've got them words going in me all the time, that's making me gentle. It's making me long suffering. It's making me full of joy and peace. It's not making me full of anger and bitterness and envy and having to constantly criticize that person, you see. So he goes and he puts down the idolatrous priests, all these priests that were for Baal, for the idol made from a grove for the host of heaven and they're offering sacrifices to that stuff instead of offering sacrifice to the one true god he puts down the idolatrous priests you see there are men of the devil who are ordained for satan's ministry and second chronicles 11 and verse 15 it says and he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And I believe a lot of these entertainers are just ordained priests for the devil. And the concerts are like worship services. I mean, they even look like a satanic worship service now. A lot of times they don't even disguise it. It's red and black and fire and um, it looks like hell and it looks like a whore on stage. And you probably know who I'm talking about. But, and you know, uh, looking like a whore on stage goes right along with this, as you'll probably see in a minute, as uh, you can get so far in, in this wicked stuff that sex becomes a part of the worship service. And it says, And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense, in the high places. So the kings are so wicked. The kings of days gone by were so wicked that they ordained these idolatrous priests 
to burn incense in the high places, in the cities of Judah, and in the places around about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. So they're burning incense to all these false gods. And you see, it's the kings that ordained it. A lot of times a, a wicked ruler is a judgment from God on a people. And God uses this wicked ruler to just lead you further down the pathway of wickedness and destruction. Because that's the way you, that you really want to go deep down. But the word of God, it's going to purge your pathway. The word of God's going to put down the posers if you listen to it. And see, if these kings were doing this back then, what do you think the rulers are doing today in the dark? I mean, they cover it up and look real civilized to you on TV. But what do you think they're doing? You know, all that stuff that that a lot of people have come out with that these rich people do behind closed doors. I think there's a lot of truth to it. Because look how wicked these kings of Judah were. Look how wicked the kings of Israel were. But the word of God, it puts down the posers. Look at verse 20 in this same chapter. You go over to verse 20, and it says, And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars, and burned men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. So he had to take it as far as slaying the priests of the high places. Now, me and you, we're not trying to bring in a kingdom of heaven. We're, we're in a spiritual kingdom of God. We're not under the law of Moses. We're under grace. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So we're not going to go out and slay the posers as Josiah had to do. We're going to put out the word of God and the word of truth, the sword of the spirit, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This sword of the Spirit will put down the posers. It's going to expose their false doctrine. And it's going to lead other people who are sincere and seeking truth. It's going to lead them away from the posers. Now you look at verse 24 also in this same chapter. And it says, Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits people that be, are talking to uh, spirits that are familiar with with people. So when that person dies, that spirit was familiar with them and they can trick you into thinking, well, I'm that person that died, you see. But it's really an unclean spirit posing as somebody that's died. And there's uh, posers who pretend to have these spirits that they talk to. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards, wizards, uh, people who yeah, got their books of spells and they've got all this wisdom and uh, the occult and, and wickedness and they maybe even hooked up with the devil and they can do some, some magic. He, but he's taken away these workers with familiar spirits and these wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spotted in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. See, he found the book and he's putting down the posers. He's putting down the workers with familiar spirits. He's putting down the wizards. These people that claim that they've got something so great something out of this world when the Bible is something so great and something that's out of this world. Now, look at verse 6. 2 Kings 23, 6. Well, let me finish 5. It says, They're burning incense unto Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the planets, to all the host of heaven. You know, I'm constantly hearing people, for some reason, acting like, the sun isn't real, the moon isn't real, and that there's not really planets. I don't know if you've heard that, but the Bible talks about the sun. The Bible talks about the moon. It talks about planets. And it talks about uh, stars. 
Look at Acts 14 and verse 12. Acts 14, 12 says, And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul they called Mer Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands into the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So the Bible talks about planets. It talks about earth. It talks about the sun and the moon, the stars. So I believe that, you know, you know, what you look up and see, it's real. It's not a projection or nothing. But see, they're they're burning incense to Baal and to the sun and the moon. Well, I got news for you. They can't smell it. And Psalm 113, look over at Psalm 113, 4. Actually, Psalm 115. Psalm 115. 4 says their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are likened to them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Talking about these idols. It said... Noses have they, but they smell not. Now, they're offered these. He's got, they got these idolatrous priests that Josiah had to put down, who's offering incense, who's burning incense to these idols, and they can't even they can't even smell it. Now, you know what that reminds me of? You've got all these people worshiping these entertainers and celebrities and everything else, and they can't hear you. They can't smell you. They can't see you. Now, if you was right in front of them, they could. But most, the good majority of the worship that these celebrities get, they don't even see it. They don't even know about it. They don't even know who the worshipers are. That's just like this. They have mouths, but they don't speak to you. You don't ever have these celebrities speaking right to you personally, on a personal level. They got eyes. But they don't see you. They don't see you as you're worship, worshiping them on YouTube. And they don't read your comments of how glorious and beautiful and how much that they've helped you. They don't see that. But God sees everything and God can hear you. God can, God can sense everything that you're doing for him. And he walks around with you every day. And when you find the book, that's God talking to you. And 66 love letters he's given you. So, Josiah's cleaning house. You get down to verse 6. It says, And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kedron, and burned it at the brook Kedron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. So the grove here, like I said, it's a carved image made from the grove. And he just, he's taking this stuff and he's stamping it to powder. He's stepping on it, crushing it, stomping it. In Matthew twenty one forty four, it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him, grind him to powder. The Lord Jesus Christ, when you get in this book, he'll start grinding those idols to powder. This book will, this is the next thing here. The word is a plug for the ears. It'll purge your pathway. It'll put down the posers. It's a pillar of truth. And it pulverizes to powder. Just like the living word will grind it to powder, the written word will grind it to powder. And it's just like over in Exodus 32, 20, 
When Moses came off the mountain and he saw him worshiping that golden calf, look what he does. Exodus 32, 20. And he took the calf, which they had made, and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. There's you a, a powdered drink. And in Deuteronomy 4.21... It says, Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in into that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. I'm reading you the wrong one. It's Deuteronomy 9, 21. Deuteronomy 9, 21 says, And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust, and I cast thereof, and I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. It pulverizes to powder. That's what the word does. It can do that with your sin, it can do that with your idols, it can do that with your problem. You just gotta seek out the book of the Lord and read. And thou shalt be in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, for he trusteth in thee. It'll take the stuff that shouldn't be in your life, and it can stamp it small to powder, just like Josiah does with these, these idols. Now look at verse 7. It says, And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. Remember how I told you the perverted stuff was involved in the worship. The houses of the Sodomites is by the house of the Lord. Sodomy was part of the worship service. So the, the, the book, the pillar of truth, when you get in it, perversion is put down. You want to quit being as much of a pervert? You got a problem with that perverted stuff? Get in the book. Seek out the book of the Lord and read. When you find the book, that stuff starts looking dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. He broke down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. They were decorating it, making it look good. And he brought all the priests, and that reminds you, though, they make they make it look good. They make it look appealing. They make it look like, oh, that's where I want to be. In verse 8, and he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places. See, instead of defiling the temple of the Lord, which is your body, defile the wicked stuff. Part of building for the Lord is breaking down the rubbish. So he defiles the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand, I bet that hurt, at the gate of the city. Um, he break down the high places. See, anything that... Anything bad in your life, you're, you may not be able to get rid of it just like that. You've got to break it down, and that's going to take time. It may take knocking out one brick at a time, but that's one less brick of, that, that, of fortification that that sin has that you're breaking down. Then verse 9, Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. So these priests of the high places, those priests, those idolatrous priests that had been ordained, came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. But they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren, and he defileth, defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man 
might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Finding the book is in the best interest of your children. Just like here. He found the book and he went in there and defiles Topheth in the valley of the children of Hinnom that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. That's child sacrifice. He's putting down the child sacrifice. This Topheth place that it's talking about here is the area in the valley of Hinnom where child sacrifice occurred. Topheth means a drum. And this is possibly because it's those drums were used to drown out the sounds of the cries of the children being sacrificed. Let me show you some verses on this place. Jeremiah 7, 31 through 34. It says, And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. It never even came into God's heart for you to sacrifice your child. God wants you to love your child. Look at Isaiah 30, 33. Isaiah 30 and verse 33. When you find the book, it's in the best interest of your kids. Isaiah 30, 33. For Tophet is ordained of old. Yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. So there it's talking about Tophet. And it's associated with fire. Look at. And see, the Lord's just going to turn that into. When he comes back at the second coming, he's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance. And instead of it being innocent children thrown in that fire. It's going to be the wicked men thrown in that fire. And Jeremiah 19, 5 through 6. It says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no, shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. You see, he's going to, the same place where they're sacrificing them kids in, he's coming in flame and fire taking vengeance. Now, pass through the fire. In Deuteronomy 18.10, he plainly tells them, don't make your son and daughter to pass through the fire. I'm not wanting you to sacrifice children. He says in Deuteronomy 18.10, there shall not be found any among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. See, all those posers claiming to get you hooked up with the spirit world, you ain't supposed to be doing that. You're not supposed to be making your son and daughter to pass through the fire either. Second Kings 23, 11. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son. Now see, the devil's got a counterfeit for everything. Here's his counterfeit for horses of fire. These horses that were given to the son. You know, they worshiped the son, so they dedicated them to the wrong son. We dedicate ourselves to the S-O-N son that's pictured by the S-U-N son. He, he took away these horses that were given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain. The chamberlain has the care of the chambers in an inn. And Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burn the chariots of the sun with fire. There's your counterfeit of chariots of fire and horses of fire. 
when you get in the book, you pick up on the counterfeits. You pick up on it really quick. You put down the posers and you pick up on the counterfeits. Then you get to verse 12. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made, and the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence, and cast the dust of them into the brook Kedron. This guy, he's just breaking stuff. He's throwing stuff down. He's stomping it. He's grinding it to powder. The altars uh, were made on the tops of the houses. It says in the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz. So they go up on their roof. They got their altars up there. They got it right at home. They got it right in their house. Look at Zephaniah 1.5. Over in Zephaniah 1, 5, it says, And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm, and them that, have, that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. So you see, they worship these evil spirits upon the housetops. And here in verse 12, it says, And the altars that were on top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kedron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemish, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. So the high places that were before Jerusalem, the high places is where they'd go to worship their gods, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded. So you see Solomon, a wise man, and you're going to get wisdom from the book. He wrote Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Song of Solomon. But when he departed from the book, he didn't act too wisely. In 1 Kings 11, 5 through 7, you see Solomon, Solomon's departure from the Lord, it says, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And see, he's bringing these false gods in. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So he's getting these false gods from these other uh, people because he's taking in wives of these other idolatrous places. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. They're burning incense to them. They don't smell it. They don't see it. Eyes have they, but they see not. Noses have they, but they smell not. You see, he turned, Solomon turned the Mount of Olives into a Mount of Corruption. But back over in 2 Kings 23, 13, let me tell you about these gods here. You got Ashtoreth, that's the goddess of the Zidonians, also known as Ishtar and Astarte, also spelled Ashtaroth. And I'm just going to name you some verses with this God in it. Judges 2.13, Judges 10.6, 1 Samuel 7.4, 1 Samuel 12.10, 1 Samuel 31.10. Ashtoreth is often represented by an image of a nude female. Then you got Chemish, Chemosh, the 
Moabite God. You see, you see this false god in Numbers twenty-one twenty-nine. Let me make sure I'm giving you the right one on that. Yeah, Numbers twenty-one twenty-nine, Jeremiah forty-eight seven, Jeremiah forty-eight thirteen, Jeremiah forty-eight forty-six, and the name could mean destroyer. That's very fitting. If that's right. So all these false gods have been brought in. But he's going through and he's breaking them in pieces. And he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. He's cleaning house big time after finding the book. It says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. You see, Jeroboam, that king way back there in 1 Kings 11, 12, 13, he just keeps on showing up because for right off, he brought idolatry into the kingdom to compete with true religion, with true worship of the Lord. He was word sick. The people was going to go back uh, to J Judah over there and start worshiping the true God. So he makes his own false religion to compete with it. But Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder, powder and burned the grove. He's just going through. He's burning stuff and he's grinding stuff to powder. And as, Jos and as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them up on the altar. So he took the bones of these idolatrous people and even burned those and burned them up on the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. He's just doing, he's just trying to do according to the word of the Lord. Standing by the book. They had stood to itiveness. They, they were standing by the pillar of truth. Then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. So you see, Josiah is fulfilling the prophecy that that young prophet prophesied back in 1 Kings 13. And the title is is the name on this, this tombstone there. It's that young prophet from back there in 1 Kings 13 that preached against Jeroboam. And it says in eight, verse 18, And he said, Let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Now that prophet that came out of Samaria, that's that old man of God that deceived the young man of God. So they didn't bother the bones of the old prophet or the young prophet. You see, the word makes you recognize real believers. And it makes you realize the posers too. But they don't touch their bones and all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the king of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. So if it provokes God to anger, it's got to be gotten rid of, just like your sins were taken care of at the cross. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, he took your sins on the cross and the moment you got saved, they were taken away. The wrath of God fell on the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And that wrath was appeased. All the stuff that provoked God to anger was put on the cross. And just like Josiah took it away, the Lord takes it away. In verse 20, And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars, and burned men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. This guy is rough. 
And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. See, as it is written. That's the way of life of a Bible believer, is to do things as it is written. And he's putting them back on track to do the things of the Lord, having them keep the Passover. And this is the greatest Passover that's been done in a long time. It says, Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the, day, nor of the kings of Judah, the kings of Israel. That would be your kings that were over the ten northern tribes. The kings of Judah were over Judah and Benjamin. Remember, there was that split in the kingdom. Rehoboam uh, listened to the young men instead of listening to the old men. It caused a div division in the kingdom. And Rehoboam took the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Jeroboam took the ten northern tribes. And from since then to this time that we're reading here even, you've got a split in the kingdom. Kings of Israel, kings of Judah, and none of them had had a Passover this great. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, or in this Passover is holding to the Lord in Jerusalem. So in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, he has this great Passover. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spot in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law. He's just trying to do what the book says. He's trying to do as it is written, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. What a compliment. So like unto him, was there no king before him? Did he actually do better than David? Than Asa? Than Hezekiah? Now you could argue that, that David didn't have to turn to the Lord because his heart was always right with God. Even in his sin, it seemed his heart was for the Lord. Uh, generally with David, everything was was right all the time. He didn't have to make a great reform, turning back to God. But still, this King Josiah, he, he compared compare all the other kings to him. He's, he's the greatest one. Maybe outside of David, but even maybe even better than Hezekiah, than Asa. That's the ones that stick out to me. David, Hezekiah, Asa. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all. With all means like together. And see, Manasseh, he even got right at the end of his life. But Manasseh messed up so bad, one of the w wickedest, if not the most wicked king, even though he got right at the end, he did so much bad that Manasseh's good couldn't even outweigh it. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel. So he's going to do to Judah what he's done to Israel. Israel's done went into captivity. So he's going to do the same to Judah. And will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And the house of which I said, My name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And, you know, over in the book of Chronicles. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him. And he slew him at Megiddo. Now, King Josiah, the good king's the one that's getting slew here. And he slew him at Megiddo when he seen him. 
and that's more detailed in Second Chronicles 35, 20 through 24. And his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took, took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. Now, the, this goes to show you King Josiah, as good as he is, he's not perfect. So you know what the this book does? It places preeminence on Jesus Christ. Because when the Lord fights in Megiddo, he's going to win. When he comes back at Armageddon, he's going to win. Josiah didn't win. He went out there and got killed. But when the Lord shows up at Megiddo, he's going to win. He's going to... See, Josiah went against Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, a picture of the Antichrist, and died. The book places preeminence on Jesus Christ, even though it just gave this great compliment to Josiah and put him really up there really high. It brings him right back down. He gets involved in something he shouldn't have even gotten involved in, dies, and automatically places the preeminence on Jesus Christ. That's what the book does, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So the book is a plug for the years. It purges the pathway. It's a pillar of truth. It puts down the posers. It picks apart the counterfeits. It does all that stuff that I mentioned. And it places the preeminence on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's 2 Kings 23. When you find the book, part 2, what the book does. Have you found the book? Do you have a daily Bible reading plan? Do you hide the word in your heart? Do you study the book? Do you study to show yourself approved unto God as a work beneath not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Get in the book. Stay in the book. Not just Sunday morning. Not just Sunday night. Not just Wednesday night. But Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as well. You got to live in it.